Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Today I'm bringing you the first of the archived Patreon projects from the vault. I will be releasing a handful of previously Patreon exclusive projects here on the channel over the next year as I go ahead and search for a house, uh, which is going to be a very time consuming process. My patrons very kindly agreed to let me release some of their exclusive content here on the channel. So despite some of my narration and anecdotes probably being a bit out of date at this point, I hope you can still enjoy one of these projects from the vault. Today I'll be making a requested item, a bow tie collar blouse, a pussy bow blouse, or a secretary blouse. Other names they're called by sometimes, but um, you know, a bow collar blouse. You can have these with a high neck, a big bow, a little bow, a thin bow, a lower neck. You can do lots of different variations. Um, today I only had enough fabric to make something that was on the shorter sleeved side of things, the all-in-one sleeve that I'm always using, but you could of course use this with a regular bodice block or anything like any kind of sleeve you wanted to. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm already rambling here. I'll show you what I came up with over on the blue patterning table of doom as always. Now today I am going to be using my all-in-one block <laughs> as I'm always using I know um, because I just don't have enough of this fabric to do a separate sleeve. So today I'll be using the all-in-one block but you could just as easily do this same sort of thing to the regular block of course as well. I'm just using this because I didn't have enough fabric to cut on an additional sleeve. Although I would love a blouse like this with the big huge bishop sleeve Alas, it is not in the cards today. I was trying to go through my stash and see what I had in stock that would work for a blouse like this because I was hoping to do be to be able to make one as opposed to just doing a demonstration today as I originally thought I might be stuck with because I didn't think I had any good fabrics in stock. So here I am just tracing a copy of this. This not only would be cut on the center front there, but you see I crossed that out because today we're going to have a space for a button placket. Um, you could do buttons along here, but today actually I decided to go ahead and do a hidden placket and instead of doing buttons I did snaps um, just because I didn't want to have to put buttonholes in this um, silk fabric I'll be using today. I'm using a silk crepe de chine fabric which is rather lightweight silk. Um, it's crisp and strong but I just didn't want to have to fuss with putting buttonholes in it so instead I decided to go ahead and do snaps but the same idea here you could use buttons but I have um, I was trying to decide how to do this button placket so that it would have the extra little flap to cover you know, you've seen blouses like this, you know what I mean, right? So basically what I did there is from the center front, I came out 5 eighths of an inch three times because that's how much I, how wide I wanted my placket to be. And I need the first time to be the placket that shows, then it folds back, then again for the placket part that actually has the buttons or snaps on it. And then lastly, an inch and a quarter after that also to fold underneath and just to kind of provide a facing. So I added the width of the placket that I desired, 5 eighths of an inch, three times, and then an additional amount as facing, which I added an inch and a quarter here. Hopefully that makes sense. And then down here, I'm just drawing on a little bit of an extension to the end of the normal bodice pattern here so that it becomes a blouse pattern that I can then tuck in. Of course, I make these still quite short because I'm always wearing things at my waist and it'll just be tucked in, so no problemo. I just added on three and a half inches down here. And then right at the waist, I came out in a quarter of an inch and then smoothed that into a bit of a little, little bit of a curve just around the waist that I wouldn't have to worry about any additional ease there. I don't add, as we know, a lot of ease to my patterns ever, honestly. So the fact that I even added a quarter of an inch for this is surprising for me because I usually just make things quite tight, if we're honest. Although again, I actually have finally taken my block and shaved off a little bit from the side seams because I'm tired of everything coming out just a little bit too big. Um, I really need to either like figure out, I need to figure out what's going on with my fit, honestly, but Again, it's uh, close enough still that I haven't really minded, but perhaps my shape has just changed a little bit as well over the last, you know, five years, seeing as now I am 30 and, uh, you know, bodies change throughout time. It's just how life works because I'm human. Um, but here in the back, I'm doing the same sort of thing. I'm just going to copy that side seam, that little, again, quarter inch out from the side seam and the little extension down here for again, being able to tuck the blouse in. I think I made it uh, four inches at the back as opposed to the three and a half at the sides, but whatever. And then I don't need the seam allowance that is on my block, of course, for this back here, because this back will not have a closure. It will just be cut on the center. So I made sure I just traced the center back here as opposed to the seam allowance from my block because I do not need it for this particular project. So no real modifications yet. I've just kept the darts where they are and then just added on the little, I guess, peplum-ish extension to these front and back and then the um, stuff with the placket here in front. Just thinking that through, hoping 
that I have an idea. And then here I'm trying to figure out how long I want to make the strip for my bow here. So I was thinking I want to, when it hangs down, I want it to be at least as long as the blouse itself in the front, plus like how long I want the loops of the bow to be. So I was trying to just kind of parse out what I wanted here. And then I measured my neck here, of course, taking in, into account the seam allowance overlapping at the shoulder. Um, so I'm measuring the neck. It's going to end up being six and a half, three and a half in the front and three in the back. So six and a half added on to my length of my bow, of course, because it has to go around my neck. So I had like 36 and a half inches here um, times two. So I can go all the way around the neck, of course, like so. Um, so I wanted at least probably, I don't know, an 80 inch around their length of bow. Um, of course, you could have something shorter if you wanted a shorter bow with shorter ties in the front. You can have something thinner or thicker. I'm just going to make my ties a finished width of two and a half inches and then a finished length of around 80 inches. I actually just ended up using the width of my fabric while making these ties, so I'm not even sure exactly how long I made mine in the end, but at least 80 inches, basically. So just figuring that out, and because I want them to finish at two and a half inches wide, I will cut this at six inches, but instead of making a pattern for this, I'm just going to tear the fabric so that it is completely on grain, basically, um, because with a fabric like this, you can go ahead and just put a little snip in it and it will tear exactly along the grain, which is straighter than I could cut it, honestly. Um, so here I am measuring how much fabric I actually have here. I have a yard and a half and it's about a 54 width fabric or 56, wow, see, 56 width fabric. So if I cut a little snip six inches into the fabric and tear it, I will have a six inch by 56 inch piece that I can use for my bow. I of course need two of those because again, I want it to be longer than 56 inches. Hopefully this all makes some sense. Uh, as usual, I always feel like I'm speaking in tongue twisters. Um, it's not actually intentional, you know? And then I was trying to decide how did I want the stripes of this fabric to go? Did I want them to be horizontal or vertical on this blouse? Of course, the like normal straight grain of the fabric, if I fold it salvage to salvage, would have resulted in horizontal stripes across my blouse like this. Um, but I was thinking that I wanted to do actually vertical stripes instead. So I ended up taking this fabric over to the ironing board and ironing all along one of the vertical stripes so that I could go ahead and place my pattern pieces aligned upon that. That way I could just make sure that like things matched at the side seams as best they can. Of course, this print is kind of random, so it's not gonna be a huge deal if things don't match up, but my pattern pieces didn't fit next to each other when it was folded like this. So I ended up folding it so that the stripes would be vertical. And in the end, I'm really happy I did this because I love the way that the back of this blouse looks in particular. So you'll see in the end, how the pattern placement came out. But I'm just pinning my two pieces on here. And then of course the rest of this fabric, I will just again tear. And you'll hopefully see that in a moment here. Hopefully the camera picked that up. Um, but I'm just pinning this with some finer silk pins onto this silk. Of course, working with silk is always, you know, a little bit of a challenge. I'm kind of used to it by now after years of sewing. Um, this is silk crepe sheen I actually quite like working with. I like working with silk crepe more than I like working with rayon crepe, honestly. Um, I find it less shifty and more stable. But some people use a rotary cutter and like a self-healing mat to cut silks, which apparently works very well. It's not something I have access to or have ever really used before. Um, I just carefully cut things out with my scissors and hope for the best, you know? I bought this fabric originally, I have about a yard and a half here. I bought this fabric originally um, to make a 1920s one hour dress to wear uh, on my last trip to France, actually last trip to Europe in general. Um, in 2016, but I didn't have time before my trip to end up making the dress. I wanted something kind of impressionist looking to wear when going to see lots of impressionist artwork while I was in Paris because my mom my mom quite likes impressionist um, artworks. They're actually not my favorite. I mean, I love color, so we can agree on that front, but I like realist paintings and um, kind of, I guess, well, yeah, realist movements in general just because I like to see clothes depicted quite exactly, of course, because my most... Ex the thing I'm most excited about usually in a historic artwork is to see um, what people are wearing <laughs> and like portraiture and stuff like that. So I like seeing exacting replications of like, you know, lace cuffs and collars and different brocades and 18th century dresses and stuff like that. So I tend to prefer like Reynolds and Gainsborough and John Singer Sargent as opposed to Impressionist paintings. But my mom, on the other hand, loves Impressionism. so. I know when I'm going to museums with her, we end up seeing a lot of impressionist things. 
And yes, I like to dress to theme, so <laughs> I would like to have a slightly impressionistic dress when viewing Impressionism. I'm, I guess, is that, is that a quirky thing to do? I'm not sure. But here are my strips just pulled again. You see I was measuring six inches into the fabric, putting a little slice and then um, tearing it the rest of the way. So I end up with these straight grain pieces. Um, and as you can see, the stripes were not printed exactly along the grain of the fabric because when I tear these, it does rip along the exact grain and the stripes do not align perfectly. So whatever, just going to have to make it work. Again, it's kind of a random print, so eh, it'll be fine. But I'm just going to sew these two 56 inch long pieces together for a very long tie. I do end up cutting about 16 inches off this, um, eight inches off of each end because they were just too long. Um, but I just left them long at this point, and then I decided that like after I had sewn this together, I would play with it and tie it around my neck a little bit and decide how much to cut off and exactly how long I wanted my bows, my bow length ribbons to be. But here I can go ahead and start marking my darts onto this silk. Of course, things get lost in this print quite easily. And I was making sure that both my fronts, I cut them the front here along the fold, um, even though of course it needs to be open because I wanted it to be mirrored exactly on either side of the blouse so that when things were done, everything would line up and be symmetrical in front. So here I am cutting the fold for my front piece here. Of course, you do not want to mess this up. I have done this before where I'm like, do to do I have to cut the back open, or, and then I will cut the front instead and vice versa. Oh, I've definitely done that. And then I have to figure out how to have a seam and smaller seam allowance and uh, don't make that mistake. Only cut your folds open on pieces that weren't supposed to be cut on the fold. It's the moral of this story. Here I can use the awl to mark my darts in the pattern piece and then color pencil, of course, to mark my silk here, like so. Again, no one ever sees my colored pencils, pencil marks except for all of you, so I don't really mind using colored pencil. I find it works best for me. I did use chalk later in this project, I think. I don't remember. I was using chalk recently and I don't remember which project it was on because I've been actually sewing quite a lot. And I have a lot of more, a lot more sewing coming up because I'm about to jump back into the Victorian costuming and doing the day bodice, which could be quite the task. So I have quite a few days blocked out to do that. And then um, I have a couple other sewing projects. I might actually only have three videos in March. I'm not sure how it'll work out. I mean, on the main channel, of course, we will still have our bonus video here, um, same as usual, but I'm trying to work in how I'm going to have a little bit more time to do some dedicated writing time. But as we know, as much as I make it my goal to give myself time to write, I am not very good at taking time off of YouTube, basically. Um, it's hard to uh, agree with myself that I can take a week off and not do a video because I just know that the algorithm really doesn't like it if you take time off like that. I don't think people mind as much, but the algorithm usually... I think there's a kind of a digital penalty for taking any time off like that because it likes consistency. The robots like consistency. <laughs> um, here I am over on my machine. I actually have just put a new needle in here, a lightweight needle, like a smaller size needle to be working with the silk because I sewed the first dart and I noticed immediately that it was pulling, like the needle was hitting different threads and pulling threads I mean, the dart came out fine, but like you can tell in a print like this when the needle is hitting the threads and they're getting pulled just a little bit because it kind of makes the print look a little bit ecot like if you know what I mean. Hopefully you know what I'm saying. So here I'm thinking, why did that come out so bad? Hmm, let's go ahead and change my needle for the next time because we want it to be nice and pretty and not mess with the fabric. And it was just, obviously there was like a burr or the bluntness going on with that other needle. So I ended up switching to a new one, which is why it's good to always have needles in stock. So here you can see me taking it out and I'll put in a new one. I also lowered my tension a little bit just because the tension on this machine in general is quite high. I probably should reset the dial a little bit, but in general, I need to do kind of a full service on this machine. Um, I haven't really gone through and cleaned away fuzz and re-oiled every single gear since I got this machine. So I want to go ahead and go through and oil everything again and make sure I clean out any fuzz that has accumulated over the past, you know, few months in general, but this machine is such a workhorse. I, when I was uh, working on that velvet dress recently that you saw in my um, recent alterations video, couldn't find the word, um, this machine, I was so impressed with how it just like powered through like several 
layers of like thick puffy velvet and it was like what it's fine i think you could sew through anything including your finger so i do try and be careful with this machine but uh it could use a a full tune-up so i'll be getting to that soon here before i jump into the victorian stuff because i wouldn't want it to malfunction while working with the lovely silk taffeta of course and here i had a problem where i sewed past my dart just a little too far so i I was like sewing right, 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 right on the edge of the fold, but instead of coming off, it just kept sewing. And so I pulled a few stitches out where I had gone over my dart mark, basically. And then I could tie my dart shut as, as usual, as normal. But just going through here and sewing the two darts, one on each front piece and then two darts on the back, one on each side of the back. I can't tell you how happy I am with the way this came out, actually. Um, I was It was kind of a bonus project for me because I didn't think I had anything in stock, and so I wasn't kind of even planning on being able to sew anything this day um but i am really pleased with how this came out uh it's just a really i mean it's just so nice working with silk fabric i guess is the moral of the story and it does make me feel like i should rise to the occasion and do nicer seam finishes which will, you will see um i do finish all the seams for this garment on the inside and so it's a very well finished garment which is not always the case with me honestly unfortunately i wish i was less lazy but this time i, I stepped up to match the fabric. Go ahead and press open the seam on my six inch wide, 112 inch long currently bow. <laughs> Again, I will go ahead and cut off 16 inches of this total length eventually, eight from each end because I didn't this and like here actually while I'm off camera I'm holding the bow up to my neck in the mirror and seeing if I tie this long unsewn strip into a bow what it looks like and seeing how much I want to cut off basically so I've decided hmm I think I need to cut off a little bit from the end of this again you could have a really really long bow if you want to you could have a really long and wide big huge giant oversized bow or you can have a very thin and small thin bow it's up to you all these are design decisions that you must make. A lot of my design decisions on this particular boss, however, were dictated by the fabric itself and how much I did or did not have of it. So I'm just cutting off eight inches from either end of the bow there, like so. That will make a good face mask eventually here, those little pieces I just cut off. So I can have a face mask to match this blouse eventually if I want. Go ahead and just give my darts a quick little press here. Really get lost in this print. I was using like a dark greenish, dark tealish green thread for this because I just had to kind of choose a color. Um, and I really, I've been trying to find a dark, dark teal thread because I have a fabric in my stash that is like a really nice dark aqua teal color, but I can't find good color matches for thread and for a zipper actually. Like the zipper that Mood on, when you're shopping with moodfabrics.com, as I so often am not sponsored. They usually will suggest like a color of zipper to match your fabric you're buying um, and they suggest like this dark aqua one for me and it's still like several shades too light of a teal for the fabric I have. So finding a dark teal zipper, I might just have to use like a navy blue or a black zipper, but we'll see. But now that my darts are all pressed, I can go ahead and line up my side seams and my shoulder seams. Um, for the side seams, I decided, decided to go ahead and test a piece of this silk on my serger to see if it could withstand such things. Whenever I'm using a finer uh, or delicate fabric, anything that I'm not used to using really, I will go ahead and test a piece in the serger to see if it can handle it. Um, because if it can't, I will use a different seam finish, of course. I don't want to, again, mess up my silk in any way. But this worked just fine through the serger, as we can see here. I Put a little scrap piece through and no adverse effects despite not replacing my serger needles like I had to with my machine. But I will go ahead and just serge the side seams of this um, because the seams along the top of the shoulder, the shoulder seam here with my all-in-one sleeve pattern are straight across which means I will use a different seam finish to finish those um, as opposed to just having to serge them I'm going to do something else because you can easily finish straight seams nicely it's just these curved seams where it's like more of a pain, so I decided to go ahead and use the serger on these. Again, no one will ever see, except for you. I highly doubt couturiers use a serger ever. But do they, I wonder if they do in like ready to wear 
like high-end ready-to-wear fashion. Like if you're paying like a thousand dollars for, I don't know, a Marc Jacobs blouse, how are the seams finished inside? An interesting question. I remember when I was in fashion school, they used to tell us, especially when I was in London, they used to say like, go to Selfridges on your break, go to Liberty's on your break, go to Saks Fifth Avenue, wherever you are, and they have high-end de high department stores, and feel free to inspect the clothes kind of and learn by going and checking out <laughs> what the high fashion designers have done. I, uh, I think it requires a certain amount of courage, however, to poke around inside high-end garments where there will be sales associates who A, want a commission, and B, are wondering what the heck you're up to and are bound to be suspicious. So they used to tell us to do things like that, and it's like, sure, but like, what do I do about, you know, Kelly, the sales associate, who's wondering why I'm poking around inside the clothes and having no intention of buying, again, an $800 blouse or whatever. So anyway, <laughs> my side seams, I have them all surged and now pinned closed. And then I can go ahead and pin my shoulder seam up here as well. I'm just going to sew this with normal half inch seam allowance. And then I'll show you how I ended up finishing this further. Back over here on the machine, I can go ahead and start sewing this stuff. The only modification I do differently over here is when I'm sewing the side seam underneath that little curve of the arm in my all in one sleeve, I sew just that little starting underarm area with only a fourth of an inch seam allowance. And that's because if I use a smaller seam allowance there, I don't have to clip into that curve. And again, in this delicate fabric, I didn't want to have to put any clips into the underarm area. So I just sewed it with a uh, smaller seam allowance, which means there's like a little bit of extra ease in the underarm, which is just fine with me. It doesn't really affect the way it looks in the end. But here I'm just sewing the shoulder seam carefully helping the start of this through the machine just because sometimes a machine will want to eat delicate fabrics like this when you first start stitching the seam. So it's important to like kind of hold onto the threads and hold onto the back so that nothing gets eaten and drawn down into the machine. This machine's not so bad about that kind of thing, but some machines can't wait to just devour chiffon and stuff like that. You know, you gotta be careful. Just back stitching at the end as usual. But then yes, here for the side seam, I'm going to sew with a normal, my normal half inch seam allowance all the way up to the curve at the underarm. And then I will kind of just taper down and narrow down to a, a uh, quarter inch seam allowance right next to the surging line, honestly. And this curve at the waist also is shallow enough that I don't end up clipping it either. I want to avoid clipping curves as much as possible in this just because it's a delicate fabric and it won't be lined, you know? If it was lined, then it offers a little bit more stability, but... So here on the curve, I'm narrowing to that quarter of an inch. You can see I'm right next to the surging off to the end. I must say it is rather again cold here in the basement today where I'm recording. The only problem with uh, doing the audio portions of my videos is that uh, I have to turn my space heater off because it's loud and annoying in the background. So it um, is quite cold down here. <laughs> By the time I'm done recording, I'm like, OK, get that heater on. I I've got socks and I've got a sweatshirt on. It's uh, rather chilly down here in the basement, thanks to Colorado being rather frigid right now. It was like seven degrees Fahrenheit recently for the last couple of days. It's been very, very cold. Luckily, of course, seeing as it's still locked down, I haven't had to go outside. But I'm just pressing open those side seams there. Again, I didn't have to uh, clip that curve down here this time. And then my shoulder seams being straight across like this. This is the one I've already finished, and I will show you how I did that. Basically, I'm going to press up in my seam allowance, and then I'm going to tuck it in on itself, um, if that makes any sense. But I'm just tucking the seam allowance underneath on itself like so, and therefore I will have, you know, a quarter inch seam allowance instead of a half inch because it's all tucked in on itself and secured, basically. And you could hand stitch this down, but I'm actually just going to go ahead and do a nice clean mas machine stitch on this. It's going to blend right into this print and it doesn't really change the way that this fabric flows or anything, especially up here at the shoulder. If anything, I don't mind adding a little bit of stability up at the shoulder because of course I like a strong shoulder and it offers a little bit of structure. So if anything, I don't mind. Just doing the other side the same way i'm putting in my pins in what will eventually be vertical to the sewing machine i'll just take them out as i go you'll see that in a moment 
But again, just making sure my raw ends are all tucked inside up against the seam like this. And then I will stitch this all down into place. So that looks like this up close. I'm just gonna stitch along, right along the outside edge of that fold, essentially. And I am just using my regular presser foot for this. You could use a zipper foot um, if you wanted to, but I didn't have any trouble doing it this way. Again, I'm holding my threads. You can see behind the presser foot there, I'm holding my threads as I start out so that nothing gets drawn into the machine. Just stitching right alongside that fold, taking my pins out as I go, so this seam will be entirely clean on the inside and have some exposed like top stitching on the outside, but that's all right with me. Again, you could do this by hand if you wanted to as well. All right, so now with my shoulder seams all finished and my side seams all finished, I can go ahead and start thinking about how I'm going to hem other various parts of this <laughs> because this actually goes together quite quickly, uh, but it's just depending on what hem finishes you want to use on things. So now my sleeves are unfinished and the hem of this blouse itself is unfinished and I will go ahead and actually hem both on the machine. I was thinking about using a narrow hem foot at first, but I tried it on a sample piece and that narrow hem foot and I hardly get along. So trying to do it with silk wasn't going to happen for me. So I ended up just folding these a quarter of an inch twice, both of them, and then stitching them down. So that's how I'm going to hem both of those areas. Again, I was finding the machine stitching wasn't affecting the drape of this fabric at all. So um, I didn't mind doing it by machine this time as opposed to doing it by hand. But again, once again, like always, you could do any of these things by hand for an even more, um, you know, invisible and couture finish perhaps. But here I am just turning it twice here at the end of my sleeve. This is almost under a quarter of an inch, just as narrow as possible, basically. Probably like, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's almost a quarter of an inch, but on the narrower side. I wasn't measuring it, as you can see, I was just doing all this by eye and by feel. And over here on the machine, again, I'm just gonna stitch quite close to that folded edge here. I'm stitching from the inside out, I guess. So I guess my bobbin thread is on the outside of the project, which isn't technically, I guess, ideal, but I didn't see a difference in the stitch with this machine. This machine makes a very pretty stitch, so no problems doing it this way. Just going all the way around and hemming both sleeves in the same way, and then I will hem the blouse the same way as well. Now I hadn't done this sort of hidden placket finish, uh, like hidden button or snap placket finish before, so I was trying to figure out exactly how I needed to fold this and stitch it down. So I was using the paper pattern as a way to wrap my head around this. You know, I have that kind of accordion situation going on in the front here. So we have five eighths forward, five eighths back, five eighths forward again, and then this inch and a half gets folded down on the inside to fully encompass everything. So hopefully you can see what's happening here and how this kind of goes together. It did take me a minute to kind of wrap my head around it. But again, I have that placket past the center front there, it gets folded once, folded twice, like so. And then in here, you could serge or hem this edge here, but I ended up just tucking it in and then it gets stitched, stitched down along with everything else. And so it's completely clean on the outside, completely clean on the inside. And I have this little covered placket that I can then sew my snaps onto, I suppose. So I'm gonna go ahead and start pressing all that into place over here on the ironing board. This is on the right hand side of my garment, I believe. <laughs> I get the, I have to like keep a sticky note here in my sewing room that shows what side the buttonholes and which side the buttons are supposed to go on. It's actually different, uh, or I think opposite for men's and women's clothing, but I don't really care particularly which side the buttons and buttonholes are on, especially with a hidden placket like this. Um, left and right, not something I'm tremendously uh, you know, passionate about in general, or often, and still do often get wrong. So, you know, I have to keep a, a reference point nearby sometimes to keep myself from getting all kinds of turned around, really. But once I had that worked out over here in the silk, as opposed to the paper, and had everything tucked and ready to be sewn, I could take it over to the machine. So once I have that pinned into place, just like I had uh, figured out with the paper, I went over here and I just did a line of stitching along the fold again on the inside here. And that will hold everything down into place for my little covered placket, my thin little covered placket here in front. Of course, you could do something like this much wider if you wanted more space to work with. 
Um, if you were doing buttons on this, you probably would want to make this wider, but I just went with 5 eighths of an inch because I was going to do snaps and they're quite small and didn't require a lot of space. So that's what I went with for this. Other uh, thing to note here too is that um, a lot of the blouses I have that are commercially made or like ones I have thrifted that are in this style, the placket is folded under at the top or done with a facing instead. I'll show you an example of this later. Um, so they are done differently than I end up doing my blouse, but you know, whatever. Do you think I actually thought to look at my bow blouses <laughs> before I tried making this? No, no, that would have made way too much sense and required going up and down several flights of stairs. And again, as we know, <laughs> I'm a lazy person. Anyway, now that that is all finished, I can go ahead and do the other side uh, of the placket. I basically just folded that one, you know, much more simply to finish it um, so that I had actually an inch of extension on this side instead, um, because of course I had all that extra space to work with, but also I just wanted it to underneath this where the snaps were kind of extend out a little bit further, just because if it gaped at all, which this blouse does not, um, luckily, because again, when you're doing a hidden placket like this, there's no reason to space your buttons or snaps perfectly when instead you could space them to your advantage. So we'll get to that later. Um, but if there was any gaping, I didn't want it to show. So I folded this, giving myself a little bit of extra placket underneath the center front, basically. Hopefully, again, that makes some sense. I'm going to go ahead and do the same sort of idea. Just instead of having to have a two layer second placket over here, I can just go ahead and fold it um right on in itself hopefully this makes any sense once again i'm losing my mind <laughs> to be fair i think i only got like five hours of sleep last night kind of total i remember i was checking my phone to see what time it was um and to make sure i had my alarms set correctly because while i'm falling asleep i'm anxious about whether or not i set my alarm <laughs> honestly um so i clicked on my phone and it said 3 38 a.m and i was like oh well, I don't really want to be up still at 3.38 a.m., but what are you going to do? That's winter for me, honestly. I uh, My insomnia goes a little bit wackadoodle in the wintertime. Winter is just not my best brain season, as I've mentioned recently. But, alas, winter doesn't last forever, so that's good to know. So now that is all finished on the inside and the outside as well. So my entire placket area for my eventual snaps here is done. All my hems are done. The only thing that is now raw, uh, like a raw seam or area of fabric on this blouse is the neckline, where we of course need to put our bow to finish this off. And you notice I didn't make any changes to the neckline of the pattern at all. And then I just cut a rectangular strip. Um, now, the only thing here is that you technically don't want your bow to come all the way to the end of the pack placket. And I didn't think that through. And I'm thinking here now, oh, I should have turned this placket in on itself and used it as like a facing up here at the neckline, like the commercial sewn blouses that I have do. Uh, but I didn't. And therefore, what am I going to do up here? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and cut a little bit of bias tape and then just finish the first few inches of each side of the blouse with bias tape. We all know how I love to finish an edge with some bias. So that's what I ended up doing for this blouse. None of this uh, area gets seen once the bow is tied, so it doesn't have to be perfect, but I, I still think bias is a nice way to finish this up here. Um, although this particular blouse, because I was figuring it out as I went, <laughs> is not a perfect execution, perhaps, of the bias technique I used here. So I'm just going to go ahead and pin this onto the right side here, and sew some bias to cover the first few inches of this area here. And then the rest of the raw edge will be encased inside the ribbons for the bow tie at the top here. But because these last inch and a half per se, or, or inch and a half or so is exposed, outside of the bow, I needed to finish this raw edge at the top here somehow. And I just went with bias. Also need to finish sewing my bow together here. So here I'm going to go ahead and line everything up here. This is my center back right here. Um, and I'm just going to come out six and a half inches from the center back on each side. And I should have come out further. This is the, a good point here. Um, I should have left myself a little bit more room down here. So I probably could have left myself at least an inch of room on each side. So probably should have gone seven and a half inches um, just to leave the opening for my neckline a little bit bigger. So I'd have a little bit more finagling room. <laughs> but the rest of this I'm just pinning all the way down on either side down to the ends of my ties. And you could put these at an angle of course like so. Or you could leave them straight across if you want to. Whichever you want. 
but I'm just going to go ahead and angle them like so and so, so along here, all along this edge, then stop and leave that center, then stop and leave that center section open. Again, I did six and a half inches on each side of the center back, but I should have done seven and a half. Give yourself more room than I did, you know? You want to be able to get this thing onto the collar without having to fuss with it too much. Oop, and the heater has popped back on again. Honestly, thank goodness. I know I always say that. Here I am just stitching on those little sections of bias here right in the very front. I'll just turn these onto the inside, finish everything off. I do believe I hand stitched it? I think so, yeah. I can't remember. A couple days ago now. You can't expect me to remember things that happened last week. I'm like, uh, you know, again, like I always say, how I don't believe in astrology, but I clearly pay quite a lot of attention to it. Um, <laughs> for someone who doesn't quote unquote believe in it. Um, they always like have ones where it's like saying how cancers have like a really good memory, but my memory is like of a, a, a tsetse fly or whatever. Like I, I have a terrible memory, so I'm a bad cancer in this regard. Here at the end, I'm just going to go ahead and do that little angle here at the end of my ribbon, like so. I will cut up all that excess in order to be able to turn this corner, of course, with a knitting needle shortly. So that's one side of my bow tie done. I will actually start at the point on this other side, so I will do a little bit of backstitching off the edge. And then come to where I can turn the needle and keep stitching along the edge of my bow here. Then I will turn this all right side out and give it a nice good pressing, of course. So over here, I will go ahead again, turn my little bias facings in on themselves and finish everything else up and off over here. I actually just pin them in place for the rest of the sewing this and then I actually hand stitched this little bit on the inside down last um, when I was finishing up this blouse. So I just left it like this for now while I was sewing the collar on because it was a small area. Nothing got too out of hand. All this area will be finished and encased in silk essentially no raw edges you know no raw edges on this blouse i was doing my due diligence this time so that's where that is at and of course i can go ahead and turn this right sides out trim my corners here just going ahead and going through and pressing this all nice and flat my little bow tie collar here and by little i mean very large and long <laughs> But here I am in the open center area here where I can start pinning this onto my blouse itself. So I'm just finding the center back of my neckline here because it wasn't marked. Classic me. And I will go ahead and pin the center back seam of the bow onto the center back of my blouse here. And then although this is a curved edge along the neckline of my blouse, I'm just pinning this straight edge of the bow collar to it. No problem in a flowy fabric like this. Of course, if you're using like a thick, stiff fabric, this would be hard to do, but you shouldn't be using a thick, stiff fabric to make a blouse anyway, so, you know. But here, just pinning up right up to the end, where it is, of course, got the bias tape instead. Um, that will just kind of, like, emerge from the collar itself in the end. I'll show you that in the end here. But just pinning along this side as well, everything into place, and I will stitch it down with its normal half-inch seam allowance here. Again, this is being pinned to the right sides together on the outside of the blouse, by the way. See all my different pin options at the top of the screen here. <laughs> it's kind of funny to have them all sitting next to each other. So over here, I can come into this slightly crowded area down here. Like I said, I should have given myself a little bit more room with the opening of this. Would have made all of this a little bit easier to do and a little bit cleaner in the end. But here I am just stitching on the inside. Again, that half inch seam allowance as usual, stitching the collar onto the blouse itself. over here on the ironing board I'm just taking out those 
pins that of course I just sewed over because it's me <clears throat> and because they're fine silk pins and again as I've been saying this a powerful machine would win that battle and the pin would die but uh, that's all right so now I have this raw edge of course in here and I'm just going to go ahead and fold down the other side of the bow and encompass this edge in here and I will hand stitch this down on the inside. This is how I think I finished the collar, the like kind of Mandarin collar on my Return of the Jedi dress, I believe. It's done the same way. Sometimes I forget how to do collars and have to look it up because I do them, I don't do them very often at all. <laughs> I don't normally make things with collars. It's just, you know, a little bit more fiddly than finishing something with a facing or finishing a regular neckline. And as we know, I like simple things. Uh, it's a problem. I need to diversify, I understand. Now this is a place where I'm going to go ahead and clip the curved edge because it will be all encompassed inside of the neckline here. I'm actually not clipping all the way down to the seam as well. I'm doing kind of shallower clips than I might normally because again, I'm afraid of clipping silk fabric. I don't like doing it, but it is important to clip your curves as a general rule, including up here along the neckline where they are more, they're not like a gradual curve. It's like quite a sharp curve. So it's good to clip it before it gets encased and kind of fully lined inside of the collar itself. But all of this is just getting folded down cleanly along the inside, basically. And the kind of the front of the blouse sort of just emerges out from inside this collar and gets caught in it. Hopefully you understand what I mean, or will when I give you a close up in a moment here. But I am just going to go ahead and hand stitch all of this down inside. And then I will, of course, just have to put my snaps on and this blouse will be finished. So over here at my computer desk, you can get a better idea of what this looks like where the blouse emerges from the ends of the bow, or the bow like comes off the edge of the blouse actually. And that's why I just had to finish this edge with something, in this case, some bias tape. Now again, like I was saying, you don't have to space your buttons or your snaps evenly anytime, honestly, but especially when you have a covered placket like this where they will not be seen at all in the finished garment. So what I've done here is I've spaced my um, snaps out so that I have three kind of clustered right next across the fullest part of the bust, and I have two closer to the waist, just that those areas are most secure and don't gape open at all. Um, you could always add snaps like this in between buttons as well on blouses that you find perhaps gape. Um, but of course, proper pattern drafting and having it sized correctly will help with this issue as well. But I just hand stitched my snaps on for this blouse. Didn't get any footage of that, sorry. And then as a final kind of step to this blouse, because once the snaps are on, this was all done, um, except for I decided that I would go ahead and make custom little shoulder pads to put in this blouse. So I just grabbed a couple of semi-circles of the cir of the silk, bleh, semi-circles of silk, say that 10 times fast, semi-circles of silk, semi-circles of silk, um, and a little piece of actually polyester batting, because that's just what I had in stock here. And I just made these little quick semi-circles. I didn't, I just cut them by eye. I just eyeballed this. I didn't have a pattern for this or anything. I don't normally make shoulder pads to match my stuff, but I love a strong shouldered garment. So I do need to be more diligent and do this more often. So here I've just got these little shoulder pads. You can see I just surged them together along the outside edge there. And then I'm going to pin them onto my tailor's hem here and then just kind of steam them into shape a little bit just because this all-in-one sleeve blouse doesn't have a lot of structure uh, around the sleeve and shoulder cap itself. So I wanted the shoulder pads to have a little bit more of the shape. So I'm just gonna use steam basically to steam this into place. Of course, I would prefer to have a cotton or wool batting, but I just was using what I had laying around the sewing room. So I had a little bit of polyester, uh, like padding or like quilting batting, I suppose. But here you can see, I've just pinned it onto my tailor's ham, pretending my tailor's ham is a shoulder. And I'm just giving this a crap ton of steam, fogging up my camera lens so that this takes on a curved shape like this. And I'm gonna let that cool. And then you will see it has a bit of a curve to it. So then lastly, I just need to figure out where my shoulder tip 
on this straight seam is. So I just use my pattern where I have my, I have my shoulder, the tip of my shoulder marked on my all-in-one sleeve bodice pattern. So I go ahead and put a pin there on the blouse as well. And then I actually just want to extend this shoulder pad out about a half an inch, just so it gives myself a little bit of extra shoulder going on here. Cause you know, the wider the shoulder, the smaller the waist. This is how optical illusions in clothing works. This is why the 1940s shoulder pad situation, uh, they, they make completely boxy garments sometimes, but a lot of times you'll see the shoulder wider and then the waist very small. And that illusion is helped along by the fact of this like sort of triangle hourglass geometry going on here, which is why I'm such a fan of shoulder pads as well. For of course, I do in enjoy emphasizing the hourglass in my designs and clothes, basically. My body just happens to naturally kind of be that shape. Um, I have a similar bust and hip measurement and a smaller proportionally waist measurement to that because I'm a 42 bust, 30 waist, and then 44 hip. So I kind of just am naturally that shape, which I'm not trying to brag. Trust me, when I was a teenager, this was not something I considered to be a good thing because it was still kind of the Kate Mossy sort of ideal era where to be very, very thin in, in all regards, as opposed to curvy, was what was popular. So I had a lot of body issues when I was a kid, self-esteem, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, because I didn't consider myself to be the correct shape. But it turns out any shape you are naturally is fine and is the correct shape. There is no such thing. And each era defines what is the popular shape and it changes every, you know, five or ten years anyway so just wait and then before you know it you'll be popular again but anyway before I really tangent here I'm just tacking the shoulder pads in along that point of the shoulder and then along the seam inside here just tacking it to the seam itself so you can't see these stitches from the outside Here is my finished bow blouse with its extra little shoulder pads and my covered snap plackety detailing here. Here it is with the bow tied in front, but what's something I discovered here while I was styling and playing around with this blouse is that you can actually tie the bow in the back as well. So it has like a kind of high neck turtleneck look in the front and then the bow hangs down your back and I think it looks very chic and elegant. So that's two ways to wear this. And then when I was unsnapping it, I realized I could tie the bow a little bit lower while it was unsnapped at the top and then it almost looks like an open necked lower bow version of this. And so I'm now thinking this is an extremely versatile way of making things. And I would like to make this blouse in a couple of other colors and fabrics in the future once I can get my hands on, again, some silk. And we're back to 2024 me. I hope you enjoyed this archive project from the vault today and thank you to my patrons for their support and making this video possible. And as always, I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>